Hello everyone, my name is Chin Hui and I'm incredibly honoured to be a part of PyData Global this year. And so a little bit about myself, I am a data engineer who is working in Singapore and today I will be sharing with you about how to speed up your data processing by making use of parallel and asynchronous programming in the context of data science. So, yeah. No. Yeah. So, if you'd like to follow, if you'd like to keep in touch with me on Twitter or like something online, you could find me in the following like social media. So, to start this first, to start this talk, I'll talk about about me. So. I'm Ching Hui and I'm a data engineer at ST Engineering. Um, before that, my background is in aerospace engineering and computational modeling. And since I'm a data engineer and I do a lot more data transformation and manipulation, as I am a frequent user of the Pandas library. And as a way of giving back to the community, I contribute to Pandas and if, you can, and if you read some of the documentation, you might be able to see one of my contributions. And before the pandemic situation, I do volunteer as a mentor of Big Data X, whereby, whereby we conduct data engineering workshops to equip data professionals with the skills to, uh, to improve their data engineering skill sets. And as a data engineer in a data analytics team, a typical data science workflow is as follows. So first, we extract raw data from the source, and after which we will need to process the raw data into a suitable form that the data scientists can use to train their models, which is the third step. After the model has been trained according to certain metrics and so on, that's where we evaluate the model in terms of the performance, and then when it's ready, we will look at how to deploy the model. So extract, process, train, evaluate, and deploy. Seems simple, right? Well, not really, because there are bottlenecks in the data science projects. One of the bottlenecks that you could face would be probably the lack of data, uh, if you have lack of data, you probably need to spend more time on your data collection. So a more common situation would be that the data that you collect would be probably of poor quality. It would be that you could have missing values or that maybe you might need a little bit more standardization of your data. So that's where we really need to go through data processing. So when we talk about data processing, uh, that's where I need to mention about the 80-20 data science dilemma. So the 80-20 data science dilemma states that about well, 80% of the time is actually spent in data processing and pretty much anything that is not, conduct, not conducting analytics and training the models. Like, like, yeah, so... Yeah, 80 20 doesn't sound too bad, but sorry to burst your bubble, but in reality, it is actually closer to 90 10. So you actually end up spending a lot more time on data processing and not really so much time on getting insights from your data. So, I mean, okay, so as a data science team, it's expected that most of us use Python in our workflows. So we will look at data processing in, in Python. So when we first learn about Python, one of the first things we learn is for loops. But the problem with for loops in Python is that even though Python is built on top of C, Python for loops are run on the interpreter and are not compiled. Hence, in terms of speed, it is significantly slow compared with running a for loop on C. So, just look at how we write a for loop in Python. First, we initialize a list, and then 
for each iteration, we will need to append the value onto the list. So if I am if I am running the iteration 100 times, that means that I will have to load the append function 100 times and append the element to the list 100 times. So it can be a bit slow. So what other better way to do about it? Then that's why, so that is how in Python, we have the concept of list comprehensions. The, the, the good thing about list comprehensions is that it is slightly faster than for loops. And the main advantage is that with the use of list comprehensions, there's no need to call the append function as each iteration. So if so in contrast with the for loops whereby for each iteration, I will have to call the append, op, I have to call the append function as an object or that is a feature of the list, a list. So imagine that for every iteration from one to 100, I will need to load the append function as an object 100 times. But then for the list comprehensions, it's not, it's already there and you don't need to load that function 100 times. Hence, it saves the time in terms of right, right. It terms saves the time in terms of like generating a list of values that you need without the repetitive process. Um, having list comprehensions is good and all for typical operations involving lists, but then for the type of data that we typically handle in data science projects, they can tend to be multi-dimensional with a lot of columns and so on. So hence the preference is to use pandas which is optimized for in-memory analytics using concept of data frames, which is capable of storing multiple columns in a more presentable manner. However, the problem with pandas is that like, when dealing with large data sets that are more than one gigabyte or like, in the scale of tens of hundreds of gigabytes, it will tend to run into performance and out of memory issues. So, because Pandas is actually designed for in-memory analytics, so it is not really designed and intended for out-of-core use cases. So, the first thing that we will think about is, you know, since the data is too large to fit into a core, it's not suitable for Pandas, then why not just use a plot faster? I mean, big data, right? Well, it's not so straightforward because when we talk about using a Spark cluster, it involves distributed computing. And when we talk about distributed computing, it will involve communication overhead. That means you're trying, you're trying to communicate between independent machines across a network. So six Spark cluster, for example, like typically the you know, Spark cluster, we will have a three compute nodes, but then if we want to be able to run those three compute nodes and synchronize the workflow and distribute them accordingly, then each node in the Spark cluster will have to communicate with each other such that they will know like what's the state of each of the nodes and when then they move on to the next step. So it's a bit like, you no, know, when I send a WhatsApp message, from Singapore and I'm trying to send it over to somebody in the US and maybe in WhatsApp, they do have like those multiple servers and stuff, but they need to communicate with each other. So that's the reason why, even when I send a WhatsApp message and, and then I, oh, and the receiver is in the US, it would take some, a bit of time for the recipient to be able to receive my message. So that is the communication overhead that I'm talking about. And it's not just about the communication overhead that might influence the decision to use a Spark cluster. It is also the concept of a small big data problem. So what is small big data? So 
Okay, so this concept of small big data is inspired by the small big data manifesto that talks about data that looks large, but it's not really big data. So if you would like to find out more about what are the ways to handle small big data, you could check out Itama's talk on small big data at PyCon 2020, which you can find on YouTube. So to, so to put it in simple terms, small big data means that the data is too big to fit in memory. However, it is not large or diverse enough to justify the use of a Spark cluster. And so if we have this in-between scenario whereby it doesn't really make sense to use Spark cluster, and then if I use Pandas, hey, I'm going to run out of my run off memory, then what can I do? So there's this intermediate solution that we have that is something like distributed processing, but not really. It's called parallel processing. So what is parallel processing? And so I am somebody who don't really, doesn't really like to look at long definitions and read through a whole bunch of words. So let's illustrate with an example using food. Like, okay, so in Singapore, right, we have those yakun like kaya toast. So let's imagine that I work at a cafe which sells toast. Something like a single, typical Singaporean breakfast with coffee soft white eggs, and kaya butter toast. So I'm not too concerned about my soft white eggs because I can just put them in the right temperature and then they set a timer and that's it. And it doesn't really take a lot of time. But we probably need to pick, pick and meet, pay a bit more attention to the coffee and the toast. So that's the focus of what I'm going to talk about. So task one is that I like to toast 100 slices of bread. So some of the assumptions that I make is that, number one, I'm using single slice toasters. Two, each slice of toast takes two minutes to make. And three, I'm assuming that there's no overhead time, even though in reality, there will be such slight overhead time when I am going between toasts. If we're, talk, if, if we're talking about Looking at sequential processing, I have 100 slices of bread. I feed them one by one to a processor, so in this case, a toaster, or we can also call it a worker. And then after feeding my slices of bread one by one through a worker toaster, I get 100 slices of toast. And the total execution time to complete this process in a sequential manner is 200 minutes. Imagine, so in summary, 100 toasts for 200 minutes using sequential processing. But we have a better way of doing it. Same thing, we have 100 slices of toast, but instead of feeding them one by one through our toaster, this time, we split them into four batches of 25 toast each. After that, we feed them and feed them through four toasters. So for each batch of for each batch, we will feed them through a toaster. And then after which we get 100 slices of toast, but instead of feeding them one by one, the task is executed using a pool of four toaster sub processes, such that each toasting sub process runs in parallel and independently from each other. So, what this means is that in the case whereby I have a toaster that burns out or breaks down, I will still have three other toasters which are not affected by the faulty toaster. So that's what I mean by independently for each other. And after that, 
the output of each toasting process is consolidated and returned as an overall output, which may or may not be ordered, but but the bell poses those and you don't really care so much about the order. So it doesn't really matter. So if you are looking at the start process, you, have to measure, you need to be sure that the order doesn't really matter. Um, and for the parallel processing process, the execution time is going to be 100 toes two minutes per toast and divided across four toasters, which adds up to about 50 minutes. And that is equivalent to a speed up of four times. And now we've covered parallel processing. Let's talk about what is synchronous versus asynchronous execution. So what do you mean by asynchronous? So let's illustrate it with another example using coffee. So, in the cafe, so I like to brew coffee and some of the assumptions that I make are that I can do other stuff while making coffee because I, mean, I just leave it to drip and all and I can do other stuff. Second assumption is that one coffee maker to make one cup of coffee and three, each cup of coffee takes five minutes to make. But if we're looking at a synchronous mode of execution, what will we do is that first, we brew a cup of coffee on the coffee machine. And then after the coffee is done, we toast two slices of bread after that. And then when our and then we get two toasts and one coffee as a coffee set, and the total execution time would be nine minutes. So if we imagine that we would like to have hundred sets, that's going to take nine hundred minutes. So that's a bit too much time. So how can we improve the process? So if we look at a synchronous execution. What we can do is that while we're brewing the coffee, we can do other stuff. So why not make some toast? So what they will look like is that while I brew the coffee, I could actually make two slices of toast. And the total execution time in this mode of execution will be five minutes. And that is almost and then that is pretty much shaving the execution time by almost half, which is a good thing, right? I'm doing multiple times at the same time. So it looks all good, right? If I do, uh, if I execute in parallel, I will be able to get speed up. If I can do things asynchronously while I'm waiting for something, I can do something else. So it sounds like a good idea, right? No. Parallelism is awesome, right? So if you can infer from my, this slide, the question is, when is it a good idea to go for parallelism? Is it always a good idea? Or is it a good idea to simply just buy or rent a 256 core processor and then parallelize all your codes and then expecting a 256 times speed up? Is it really that good? Turns out, not really, because there are some practical considerations that we need to think about when we are paralyzing our codes. The first and very important question that we need to consider is, is your code already optimized? Because sometimes you might need to rethink an approach, such as using list comprehensions or map functions instead of relying on for loops for array iterations. Another important thing to consider would be your problem architecture, because the nature of the problem limits how successful parallelization can be. Thus, if your problem consists of processes which depend on each other's outputs, which we call data dependency, or maybe your problem in consists of intermediate results, whereby you have task dependency, then maybe not. 
So what do I mean by data dependency versus task dependency? So data dependency is whereby I am trying to make coffee toast and then I need coffee as an ingredient to be able to make my coffee toast. So in this case, in this case, there is data dependency because the output, that means the coffee from the previous process, is going to be my input for the next process and I can't really parallelize that, right? Then we talk about task dependency, it means that whether this particular process can run would depend on the state of the previous process. So let's say whereby if I have a sink, right? And I want to wash my cups. But then I also need to wash other things. But the problem is that I need to finish washing my cups before I can wash other things. So that's what I mean by task dependency. That means that you need to have a completed state for a particular task before you can move on to the next task. So in that case, it's going to be a bit more complicated to parallelize your workflow. And on top of that, we also need to consider that there are overheads in parallelism, which can be summed up by MDAO's law, which states that there will always be parts of the work that cannot be parallelized. And I need to emphasize this again. There will always be parts of the work that cannot be parallelized. And that is because when we want to initiate a parallelism workflow, the, it, there will always be the initialization process that cannot be parallelized. And there will also be the consolidation process that also cannot be parallelized. So you can't exactly parallelize everything. And, and on top of that, we also need to consider the extra time required for coding and debugging parallelized code. So that will lead to increased complexity in terms of managing your code. And on top of this computations, we also need to consider that there will still be some level of system overhead, including communication overhead. Because for in the context of parallelism, you are communicating, you may, even though you may be communicating within a compute, you are still you still need to communicate between, like, between the cores in a compute. So there will still be some communication overhead, although not as severe as that of distributed computing. And then, so, and that's all can actually be illustrated by an equation, but let's focus more on the implications of MDAS law. Uh, MDAS law states that the theoretical speed up is determined by the fraction of code that can be parallelized. Note that it is a theoretical speed up, so there might be some practical considerations that might affect the actual speed up. Now, if there are no parallel parts, then their speed up is effectively zero. But if all parts are parallel, then your speed up is going to be equivalent to the number of cores, which can go up to infinity. But as, we think, but as I mentioned earlier, that is not entirely possible. So we need to, we need to understand that speed up is actually limited by a fraction of the work that is not parallelizable, and this will not improve even with infinite number of processes. So, which means even if I buy a 256 core instance, it's not going to help so much if our speed up is going to be limited by how much I can parallelize in the first place. When we talk about parallelism, there are two types of parallelism that we need to think of. So one will be multiprocessing, whereby the system allows executing multiple processes at the same time using multiple processors. But for multi-threading, it is the case whereby the system executes multiple threads of subprocessors at the same time within a single processor. So you can so, so the difference will be on, on multiple processes and multiple threads in a single processor. And 
and, and because of how they are being executed, faulty processing is better for processing large volumes of data, whereby you can run multiple processes to run the snippets of data. But for multi-threading, it is best suited for I.O. or blocking operations. So what's the case? Some considerations that we need to consider about parallelism in that data processing tends to be more compute intensive. Hence, the switching between threads actually become increasingly efficient if we have a more compute intensive workflow. On top of that, we also need to consider that there's the global interpreter lock in C Python, which does not allow parallel thread execution for very good reasons. Because you don't really want parallel, like you don't really want like changes to be made on parallel threads, and then you have a conflict, right? So in that case, um, how do I do parallel and asynchronous in Python? I mean, if not, I mean, I mean, what I'm doing is going to be a data processing workflow. It's not going to be some machine learning whereby I can just leverage on like the machine learning library framework, which has their own implementation of multiprocessing. So what do I do? Well, this brings me to like something that is in Python, which is the concurrent of futures module. So the concurrent futures module is a high level API for launching a synchronous parallel task. And it's introduced in Python 3.2 as an abstraction layer over the multiprocessing module. And what, what this module offers is two modes of execution, the thread pool executor for a synchronous multi-threading and the process pool executor for a synchronous multi-processing. So the difference between the two can actually be looked at as part of the library whereby the process pool executor is affected by the chunk size while thread pool executor is not affected by the chunk size. And if we look at process pool executor and thread pool executor and compare them, Process pool executor uses the multiprocessing module, which sidesteps the GIL, while the thread pool executor is subject to the GIL and is not truly concurrent as the module name suggests. And submit into concurrent futures takes an input like the function and the input arguments and it returns a futures object that represents the execution of the function. So it's the execution. Well, for the map function, it takes its input, the, fun the function, the list, and it returns an iterator that yields the results. So it's like an iterator. Okay, so let's look at some case studies. So in this case study, we are querying data from the data.gov.sg API and the response is a JSON format. And we need to get the data. So first I initialize the modules and I initialize the API request task and use the threading module to monitor the thread execution. After which I initialize my job and then I compare using list comprehensions so for list comprehensions, it's going to take 16.3 minutes. But if I use a thread pool executor with 40 threads, I'm going to get a 20.9 times speed up of, of, of resulting in 46.83 seconds. And if we look at an image processing, which is more compute intensive, we have this use case whereby like the image in the data set of different dimensions. So we need to standardize the dimensions to fit into the machine learning models. So, Similarly, we initialize the modules, initialize image resize, use the use OS of get PID to monitor the process execution. And then we and in this case, we are processing 1,400 images. And then we, and then we do the comparison. When I use map, it's about 29.29 29 seconds. And similarly for list comprehensions. But if we leverage on process pool executor with an eight-core instance we get a 4.3 times speed up, resulting in 6.98 seconds for 1,400 images. So some key takeaways that I'd like you to take, a, take away from this talk is that not all processes to, should be parallelized because parallel processes come with overheads in the form of MDOS law, system overheads, including communication overhead. And most importantly, if the cost of rewriting your code for parallelization outweighs time savings from parallelizing your code, 
maybe you should consider other ways of optimizing your code instead. So thank you for watching my talk and you can reach out to me and this multiple social media platforms and please check out my slides at GitHub if you would like a copy of it. Thank you.